So hi everyone, I'm Tiffany with the Friends of Haystack Rock. I want to thank you guys for all coming to our lecture um, tonight. We are happy to be partnering with um, the Friends of, Fate, of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Um, their program director is Kristen. She's been with them for a short time, but is doing an excellent job. Um, and she will be introducing the speakers tonight. And I hope you enjoy the show. Hey everyone, I'm just get my screen share going. All right, good evening everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kristen Bands, and I am the program coordinator for the Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. And um, I am really happy that you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, my contact information is on the screen, and I invite you please to uh, visit uh, our website and our social media to find out more about marine reserves and also more about our programming. Now before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to dive in a little bit um, about Oregon's marine reserves. So Oregon has five different marine reserves, and they are managed by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the reserves were 10 years in the making, and we are coming up on our anniversary very soon. And we have a review that is coming up also in 2023. So if you haven't visited a marine reserve, please come out to the coast. You have several different options up and down the coast. Um, we'd love to have you. The goals of the reserves are to conserve biodiversity and habitat, as well as to service sites that are living laboratories for scientific research, both formal and uh, research that is um, community driven. So for instance, working with partners like Portland Audubon to run brown pelican surveys. Uh, Cape Falcon Marine Reserve is the northerly most reserve uh, within, uh, with, with on the coast. Uh, we are situated between Arch Cape and Manzanita. We are also one of the youngest reserves with restrictions starting in 2016. Uh, each marine reserve is different in flavor, um, so we are different sizes, different shapes. Uh, we also have um, different types of animals and creatures that you can find uh, within our spaces and different activities that you can do within the spaces as well. Um, the reserves have two different designations. Uh, the red area that you see on your screen is our marine reserve proper, uh, and uh, that space is one in which no take is allowed. So you can't um, take any animals from the space, any seaweeds, uh, everything has to stay in the ocean. All the goods stay in the ocean. Um, also, uh, there's no development within the space allowed either. Now, abutting these um, marine reserve spaces often have um, two uh, marine protected areas. Uh, and with Cape Falcon, we have a shoreside marine protected area that's located around um, Cape Falcon, which is right below Arch Cape. And in the shoreside um, marine reserve, we have some uh, take that is allowed. So the difference between a marine reserve and a marine protected area generally is, is that marine protected areas allow for some take. In the case of our shoreside reserve, um, you can do angling uh, from that space. Uh, we have a western um, uh, marine protected area as well, and it is near the edge of our three nautical mile line out into uh, the ocean. So all reserves uh, go out three nautical miles into the ocean. Um, in our Western Reserve, uh, in that space, you can do um, salmon by, uh, you can take salmon and also you can do crab by trolling. Most of the habitat that we have is soft bottom. Uh, so it's uh, ripe for these type of critters to live in. The organization in which I work for, the Friends of Cape Falcon, assists the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to do education and outreach initiatives. Uh, and the main goal for this is to foster a deeper connection um, and create meaning making experiences for people like you and I, so we can ensure that these spaces are protected for future generations. Some of the partners that we work with on a regular basis, um, their logos are on the screen. Our fiscal sponsor is the Lower Nehalem Community Trust. And tonight we are par partnering with the Friends of Haystack Rock uh, to provide this lecture. Now, um, 
we entered into this partnership with the Friends of Haystack Rock um, and reached out to our speakers tonight uh, because the idea of blue carbon is something that is, uh, researchers are tackling this idea um, as it relates to coastal and marine ecosystems kind of across the world. And they are grappling with questions about can blue carbon have a major impact on climate change um, in marine reserves, in estuary sites, in um, coastal ecosystems. And so we reached out to Pew to see, can you talk a little bit more about what this means? What does blue carbon or the storing of carbon um, mean for these spaces? So tonight's talk, Oregon's Blue Carbon Policy, Where We Are and What's Next, um, our presenters will share a bit about blue carbon and explain the Oregon Global Warming Commission's adoption of the first ever natural and working lands proposal. They're going to talk about how to get more involved um, in that information and also tease out emerging research to broaden the blue carbon conversation. Our speakers tonight are uh, Bobby Hayden. He is the Associate Manager of, Cons of Conserving Marine Life in the United States through the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, Bobby Hayden engages communities to conserve ocean and coastal resources on the Western United States coast. Before joining Pew, um, Hayden worked as a community organizing and communicate at community organizing and communications for more than a decade. As the solutions stories and media manager with Climate Solutions, he worked to identify and engage new audiences for climate and clean energy campaigns throughout the Northwest. He also spent several years as the national representative for the Save Our Wild Salmon Coalition, mobilizing support to restore the Columbia Snake River Basin, which has some of the world's best habitat for sustaining wild and steelhead salmon. Joining him tonight is Jasmine D'Agostino, Program Associate, Conserving Marine Life in the United States, Pew Charitable Trusts, a Ray Diversity Fellow. Jasmine works to leverage blue carbon accounting in state greenhouse gas inventories as a way to increase protections for coastal and marine habitats along the west and east coast of the United States. She grew up in both Veracruz, Mexico and Washington State. Her passion for marine conservation led her to pursue a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii. While in Hawaii, she gained uh, experience in marine research of intertidal communities and squid through working for the Kuelu Basin Marine Laboratory and our project in Hawaii in Hawaii's intertidal. She also volunteered as a marine educator for the Waikiki Aquarium. That's all I have, and I'm going to turn it over to Bobby and Jasmine. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, thank you for having us today. Um, my name is Jasmine and I'm here with my colleague Bobby from the Future Level Trust. And today we'll be presenting on protecting blue carbon habitats in Oregon. So a little bit more about my, my uh, background. As Kristen said, I graduated from the University of Hawaii with a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Biology. And I recently moved to Oregon to work with the Pew Charitable Trust in their Conserving Marine Life in the U.S. program. I arrived at Pew as a Roger R. Liner Young Fellow, and the Ray Fellowship uh, connects diverse young professionals from underrepresented backgrounds to the field of conservation. So since arriving at Pew, I have began working on advancing blue carbon efforts nationally. Uh, so to begin, I will give you a brief introduction of Pew and the work we do within our environment portfolio. Uh, and then I will go ahead and transition us to a Blue Carbon 101. And then lastly, well, we will end with efforts underway in Oregon to conserve blue carbon habitats. Uh, so we have tailored this presentation to be very place-based and we hope you come away with a new sense of appreciation for Oregon's coasts. All right, so the Future Level Trust is a global non-governmental organization funded in 1948 by the Pew family. 
Uh, Pew began as an anonymous grant making organization and in 2002, it became a public charity. Uh, this gave Pew uh, more flexibility to engage in new initiatives and operate programs for maximum effectiveness and efficiency. So our mission is to apply rigorous analytical approach to improve public policy and inform the public and as well as invigorate civic life. So we achieve our goals with these values as our foundation. First, uh, nonpartisanship. We follow our commitment to pursue common goals, bridge divides, and build a shared path to success. Uh, we are fact-based, so we approach issues with a thorough analysis of the underlying problem and possible solutions. Uh, we pride ourselves on being result-oriented, so we design our projects with rigor and evaluate them regularly so that we can course correct if need be to achieve tangible results. And um, lastly, we have recently made a commitment to include um, inclusion, diversity, and equity into our work, uh, and we're undergoing a process to integrate these values throughout our organization. All right, so today we work on a broad array of issues, both internationally and nationally. Uh, we have a large environment portfolio and our other initiatives also include consumer policy, such as home financing, um, healthcare, such as dental care access and broadband access. Uh, so really the common thread across our initiatives is that we seek to educate the public and advance evidence-based policies that address today's most challenging problems. So specifically along the West Coast, our team um, increases protections for kelp and eelgrass and estuarine habitats. Uh, we develop ecosystem-based fisheries management plans for fisheries that have a high bycatch, um, such as halibut. Um, and in Washington in particular, we work with partners uh, to prevent seabed, mi seabed mining in the state waters, and we're looking to do the same in California. Um, lastly, we also work uh, with interested states in incorporating coastal blue carbon habitats into climate mitigation strategies. Uh, so within each campaign, we play various roles that include uh, providing technical expertise on policy development. Uh, we also advocate. Uh, we fund research to address management questions or fill any data gaps. Uh, and we implement communication, outreach, and education, or at times uh, we fund our partners to do so. So um, really the cool thing about protecting coastal habitats is this huge benefit we get from them, right? So we've been calling this our triple win. Um, and that really results in um, having measurable carbon sequestration benefits from climate mitigation. Um, we also get enhanced coastal resilience. So this would be reducing impacts of um, climate change such as, such as storms and flooding on coastlines. Uh, and this improves our adaptation. Um, and lastly, of course, the protection of biodiversity, which is crucial. So with that, um, let's go ahead and jump into blue carbon. Uh, so you may be wondering what exactly is blue carbon and how can it help combat climate change? So carbon um, is the building block of life and it's a crucial component of all living organisms. So much like the hydrologic or water cycle, Carbon moves through the biosphere and can be stored or released through a suite of geochemical, physical, and biological processes. So when we refer to the term blue carbon, uh, what we simply mean is carbon being stored or removed by coastal and marine ecosystems. Uh, the term can really be broken down into two distinct categories. And the first one is coastal blue carbon, which describes that carbon found in that narrow part where land meets sea. Um, and this would be mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. Um, of course, seagrasses are a little tricky because they are submerged aquatic vegetation, but uh, I will go ahead and elaborate why they fit into this category in the coming slides. And then secondly, we have oceanic blue carbon, and this is the carbon accounted for through the actions of marine life. So this would be like the inputs and outputs of algae or the whale carcasses that fall to the deep sea, contributing to those deep ocean reservoirs. So historically, terrestrial forested ecosystems have been looked at as the largest carbon sink. Uh, however, recent assessments have shown that coastal wetlands, while small in area, sequester substantially more greenhouse gases per acre than forested ecosystems. And because of this incredible efficiency, um, they have the potential to act as nature-based tools for mitigating climate change. All right, uh, so now we'll go into how carbon is captured and stored by these ecosystems. Uh, so two things to know uh, while you're looking at this diagram. 
Uh, first, we have three types of coastal blue carbon habitats represented here, but um, please do your best to ignore mangroves because um, as awesome as they are, we do not have mangrove ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest. Um, second thing to know is that um, carbon sequestered is being shown here by these um, blue spheres. So throughout the process of photosynthesis, plants absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use that carbon to support growth of new leaves, stems, and roots. So over time, plants shed those leaves or perhaps die, adding to that rich sediment layer below. And in that way, they lock away that carbon that makes up their biomass. So what differentiates these habitats from terrestrial forests is the presence of seawater, which fluctuates with the tides. And um, on this diagram, it's depicted by that um, dashed blue line. So with the ebb and flow of tides, sediments become saturated, resulting in very low oxygen conditions that slow the decay of plant matter. Um, so this occurs because in oxygen poor sediments, um, there are fewer organisms that can break down the organic matter. Um, so essentially, carbon is being readily stored into the system without being re reintroduced back into the cycle by decomposers. Um, so you can see that because of these unique characteristics, healthy coastal ecosystems are exceedingly good at storing away carbon for millennia and provide a natural way to prevent it from being released into the atmosphere where it can contribute to climate change. All right, so the capacity for these ecosystems um, to act as carbon sinks has launched them to the forefront of climate policy efforts. So in 2013, the climate contribution of coastal blue carbon habitats was recognized by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or um, otherwise known as IPCC. So the fact that IPCC developed an accounting protocol is an important step forward because once a standardized methodology becomes available, both national and subnational governments can work on developing carbon inventories for countries or their specific states. So in order to be integrated into climate mitigation policies, managers must first demonstrate uh, that coastal or oceanic ecosystems meet this criteria below. So first, uh, they must show that there's a presence of high carbon stocks. So in other words, showing that an abundance of carbon is being held within that system. Uh, they should also have a, a evidence of long-term carbon storage, which implies that the carbon is not being readily released back into the system through physical or biological processes like decomposition. And third, it should be accessible to measure and monitor for greenhouse gas exchanges. So meaning that researchers and stakeholders can come back to those sites to continue gathering data on greenhouse gas emissions and removals. So once all these factors are taken into account, only a subset of these environments qualify as actionable for climate change solutions. So here on the screen, we have three coastal habitats that meet the actionable criteria uh, because they hold significant carbon stocks, accumulate sediment that can be measured for carbon fluxes and are close to the shore, which facilitates mapping and long-term monitoring. So lucky for us, two of those Two out of those three habitats um, exist in the state of Oregon, uh, making our state a prime target for inclusion as a nature-based solution for climate change. So um, in the top left-hand side, I wanna bring your attention to Oregon's forested tidal wetlands, which have been called out as a vital carbon sink for our state. Uh, and Bobby will chat a little bit more about this later on. And in the top right-hand side, we have eelgrass beds, which are also a crucial sink for our entire need of additional mapping data and inclusion into the state's carbon inventory, uh, which they're presently not a part of. So um, thus far we've talked about coastal blue carbon uh, and we have kind of ignored uh, oceanic blue carbon, but oceanic blue carbon is also a crucial carbon sink. However, Unlike its coastal counterpart, it does not yet meet the criteria to be recognized by the IPCC, uh, making it difficult for states to integrate it into their climate goals. So the reason is um, the reason it's not integrated, um, even though it does sequester carbon, it's because um, it's challenging to quantify those carbon stocks and monitor them over time. 
The challenge here is really the large distribution and remote locations of these habitats. So um, really you can imagine the difficulty in measuring whale carcasses falling to the deep sea or the work involved in taking sediment cores um, in the deep ocean. Of course, as new developments in technology emerge, their designation might change. And uh, here we have a prime example of oceanic blue carbon. Um, and let's be honest, no presentation in the West Coast would be complete without a mention to kelp. Um, so we know that macroalgal systems are extensive and highly productive. Uh, kelp forests cover 26% of the world's coast. And there is evidence that they contribute to long-term carbon burial. Um, so from this diagram, you can observe how this occurs. Kelp takes up carbon via photosynthesis, but unlike coastal marshes or seagrasses, kelp does not accrete sediment in the underlying canopy because it grows in these um, rocky wave washed areas. It does, however, become unattached from those rocks during storms or through ocean currents and floats out to sea uh, where it eventually sinks or donates its carbon to deep sea sediments. Or as studies have suggested, other blue carbon habitats also have um, get uh, carbon donated um, from kelp. Uh, and these habitats could be like eelgrass beds. So uh, besides carbon sequestration, kelp forests are amazing ecosystem engineers, um, which support biodiversity, provide protection from coastal erosion, and reduce the localized effects of ocean acidification. So with all these accolades, you may be wondering again, why are they not included as actionable blue carbon habitats, or why do they not have an IPCC recognition? Again, the truth is that while these, there's currently a lot of buzz around algae, it remains difficult to map uh, due to its irregular distribution or patchy distribution. And it's also difficult to quantify those carbon uh, sites where um, it donates its carbon to. So that being said, it's not impossible. Um, and there are many assessments underway to use um, new technologies like environmental DNA to trace the fate of kelp in, in the ocean. So lastly, uh, I want to leave you with a final word on why we care about blue carbon. So from our short time together, you most likely have gathered that there is an underlying theme to our presentation, and that is attempting to reduce planet warming greenhouse gases by using natural ecosystems. Now, I want to make clear that the best way to address the climate crisis is really to curb our emissions. But I also want to emphasize that if we don't preserve coastal and marine habitats, we run the risk of accelerating climate change. Um, coastal habitats still hold very valuable carbon stocks and more and more they're being degraded from pollution and diking as well as conversion to agriculture. So as all these disturbances continue, not only are we reducing uh, carbon sequestration benefits, which help mitigate climate change, but we are also depriving communities from the ability to adapt to the effects of a warming planet. So when we put our heads together to protect and restore these habitats, we can reap the wealth of services that make coasts productive and resilient. Um, so finally, here is a complete list of ecosystem services that Oregon receives from coastal and marine habitats. Uh, first and foremost, um, they balance the carbon cycle through carbon dioxide sequestration. Um, they also provide critical breeding and nursing and feeding habitat for wildlife populations. They act as nurseries to commercially important fisheries like salmon and shellfish. Uh, they also improve water quality by removing sediments and pollutants. They, pres um, they preserve culturally important lifeways. They protect coastal towns and cities from storms uh, and flooding by absorbing the water and dampening wave energy. They provide outdoor recreations for all those recreation junkies. And they also bolster uh, tourism industry. Um, and they boost natural resource and habitat restoration jobs. So it's good uh, economic opportunity there. Um, and lastly, they promote education and scientific inquiry. So with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Bobby, to talk about more about the efforts underway in Oregon uh, for policy. Thanks, Jasmine, very much. Um, and thanks, everybody, at Friends of Haystack Rock and uh, Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve for having us um, this evening. 
My name is Bobby Hayden, um, as mentioned, and I have lived and worked in Oregon since the late 90s. Um, my wife was born and raised on the Oregon, Oregon's North Coast in Seaside. And um, so we have, our family has a real love for the Oregon coast. And um, I live and work in Portland. Um, and I've been with Pew for the past six years. Again, uh, very grateful to speak to you tonight. Um, so for the next couple minutes, I am gonna cover um, how Pew and others um, are working to make blue carbon count. Um, that is really how these habitats, um, including our beloved Oregon coast, um, can play a meaningful and quantifiable uh, role in how we act on climate. Uh, later, I'll get to some initial thoughts and how on how uh, Friends of Haystack Rock and Friends of Cape Falcon um, could potentially get involved. Uh, next slide, please, Jasmine. Um, around the globe, a Pew um, a, and other partners uh, definitely are working um, to build partnerships with uh, nations um, to help them integrate coastal wetlands into their climate plans um, and emissions reductions commitments, uh, what are called natural, uh, nationally determined contributions or NDC, NDCs. Um, these are really the, the commitments that, that nations are making. Um, most of this so far for us has come in the form of helping to connect science and scientists with policy and policymakers. Um, and again, as you, hear, as you see here on, on the slide, um, there's several nations around, around the globe that are going big um, on blue carbon in particular, and that's um, Belize and the Seychelles, um, Costa Rica. Um, and then here in the States, um, Pew and others are currently engaged in, uh, in Oregon, hello, Oregon, um, California, um, and North Carolina. And then locally, it, it's a little bit um, tangential, but it's very much related. Um, the uh, Lincoln County, uh, Newport area are uh, about to undertake in the state, the uh, Oregon's Department of Land Conservation and Development are about to undergo updating um, Oregon's estuary management plans, which um, they're essentially land use plans for Oregon's estuaries. Um, these plans were uh, visionary, quite visionary when they were crafted about 40 years ago, um, but that was 40 years ago. And um, we've learned a lot um, about estuaries and their importance as Jasmine has highlighted um, earlier. Um, also, the, the EMPs uh, did not involve coastal tribal nations at the time, um, nor did they address past uses um, and degradation of the estuary. So we also think that in addition to the blue carbon policy track that I'll, I'll get to in a second, we also think that this estuary management plan update um, is a really uh, great potential place to, to think about blue carbon and protecting these blue carbon habitats into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So at the state level, um, I, I, bring, I come bringing good news about climate, which is you know, sometimes hard to get these days. Um, last year, Governor Brown um, issued an executive order here in Oregon that includes a whole host of um, climate actions, basically charging different state agencies to do, um, to make meaningful climate um, action plans. And this included um, charging Oregon's Global Warming Commission with adopting, um, as Jasmine mentioned, the first ever for the state um, natural and working lands uh, uh, carbon sequestration um, proposal. And now historically, when, when folks hear uh, natural and working lands, that's mostly meant uh, our farms and our terrestrial forests, but um, but we are proud, Pew is proud and, and working with partners that we played in a role in helping to expand this opportunity to include coastal wetlands. Um, and the way we did that is highlighted here on the slide. We, we worked with um, several partners, Silvestrum Climate Solutions. They are a world renowned research firm that does blue carbon accounting all over the globe. Um, they've worked with the EPA and others. Uh, the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group, which includes a lot of great um, scientists and researchers from around the Northwest. Um, and then uh, perhaps most importantly, the Oregon's Department of Land Conservation and Development was a partner in this as well, uh, specifically their Oregon Coastal Management Program. So um, it's great that the, the state is looking to expand this opportunity into the blue carbon um, world. Uh, next slide, please, Jasmine. 
So the issue also of blue carbon also received as part of this, this process that the state has under, undergone over the last year, um, has received a lot of broad-based support from local, coastal, statewide groups. Um, several groups came to testify um, along the way in, in 2021. Um, and I think the commission, the Oregon Global Warming Commission really came away with a sense of how this impacts um, people um, who are concerned about climate action, coastal resilience, uh, protecting our salmon, our seabirds, uh, protecting cultural resources um, and other uh, recreational, recre recreationally, commercially and ecologically important um, species, as well as the way they interconnect with um, coastal communities and, and how we prepare for, um, for sea level rise and, uh, and other issues facing the coast. Uh, and to their credit, um, the commission really engaged uh, tribes and land landowners and managers, um, different state agencies, and all total, they said they, um, they heard from over a thousand individuals and organizations. Um, so next slide, please. So in terms of what's actually in uh, the proposal, which was voted on on August 4th and um, became kind of official official in, in early September, um, is a whole host of really cool stuff. Um, the first is an outcome-based goal, which is basically the core of the proposal that really calls on the state of Oregon to sequester um, at least, and I'm gonna throw some numbers at you, um, at least uh, 5 million metric tons of uh, CO2 per year in Oregon's natural working lands and waters uh, by 2030. And then an, at least 9.5 million metric tons by 2050. Um, and this is, um, they, they called upon the state to have this be in addition to um, Oregon's um, existing uh, climate goals. So this is plus uh, some, which is great. And so in terms of crunching those numbers, that really means um, that first goal by 2030 um, would be the equivalent of over a million passenger vehicles, um, their emissions for a year, um, or the equivalent of energy usage of um, over 600,000 homes. Um, and then this goal by 2050, if, if we are able to hit it, uh, would basically double that. Um, so that's the numbers. And then this is where it gets really interesting that the, the commission um, really called upon um, the governor and the uh, legislature and, and state agencies to really come up with activity-based metrics. And so that's math on the ground and in the water. Like how do we quantify um, real protections, uh, conser either conservation or restoration uh, goals relative to making these habitats um, survive and thrive into the future. Um, additionally, there's community-based um, metrics. So how do, we, how do we better quantify and incorporate um, other benefits to the community? Like as Jasmine mentioned, a lot of these habitats protect us um, against sea level rise, uh, that should be accounted for. Um, riding along the, the community piece is environmental justice. Um, I, I think the state of Oregon is making a renewed commitment to that. Um, and, and so the commission asked that whatever moves forward really follow the recommendations and the, um, the frameworks from the environmental justice task force and the Rachel Justice Council. Um, so with all of that, um, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, this is, um, they kind of went big on the, on the blue carbon side too. Um, and that's specifically around tidal wetlands, which I'll get to uh, a little bit more in a second. Um, they also recognize the importance of um, the need for, for more data around eelgrass and kelp. You're, you're seeing a theme from, from Jasmine and from I, like they, they really want to, um, regardless of the fact that we can't really quantify them or account, like make them count towards the IPCC's goal, the commission really identified that kelp and eelgrass are super important and we should um, include them in some way. And then lastly, um, they called for the, the formation of an actual land, uh, natural and working lands council to really synthesize and, and help move this, uh, move the ball forward here. Uh, next slide. So um, I'm gonna dive into the, um, one of the, the so tidal wetlands, tidal swamps, as they're called on this slide. I stole this from Dr. Laura Brophy. Um, I'm gonna tip, tip my hat to her a couple of times probably in the next minute or so. Um, so one area that the commission really highlighted was forested tidal wetlands. And um, 
tucked into to jet you may have missed it in jasmine's words but um these these habitats on oregon's coast store more carbon per acre than any other um, type of habitat in the world and that's why I, I added this slide at the last minute because somebody <laughs> recently was like did you is that really true did you really say that um and it's actually it actually is true and that's um, highlighted in this graph and um, afterwards we can send a, a link around to participants to a lot of these um, a lot of this information including this study um, but if you look around globally this is a uh, biggest bang for the buck is in these forested tidal wetlands um, uh, that have uh, Sitka spruce um, for folks that that know that habitat type um, I mentioned Dr. Laura Brophy um, her and others at the Institute of Applied Ecology um, and elsewhere have really done a lot of great work over the years um, and I think she actually gave a talk last year to the northern uh, the lower Nehalem Community Trust, uh, which was a really good presentation. Um, next slide, please. So just to keep keep on this theme, um, some fast facts here about uh, forested tidal wetlands. Um, this is a picture of the Sayus Law. Um, every thousand acres of this of this restored is the equivalent of emissions from fifty thousand cars in a year. Um, this, these types of habitats are critical for salmon uh, and steelhead. Um, as the slide indicates, we've lost about 95% of this habitat um, due to, to past land, land use practices, but um, it also has um, really high potential for recovery and for restoration. Um, and again, uh, tip my hat to, to Laura Brophy, who's, who's led a lot of this work. Uh, next slide, please. Here's Nehalem Bay, uh, right near you all. This is a this is a forested tidal wetland, tidal swamp. Um, enough said. Uh, next slide. So, in terms of where this issue um, heads next, um, the ball really is in the governor and the legislature's court. Um, there's plenty that the governor could do: um, new strategies to protect and restore blue carbon. Um, avoiding for, further loss of these these habitats, allowing for in, inland migration um, for these habitats given sea level rise. Um, and as mentioned, there's still data and science gaps that need to be filled. And so part of the advocacy really is like, we, we need a little bit more science here. Um, and in addition to where the blue carbon um, issue goes on the policy front, um, I think it's definitely time uh, for the collective we uh, to really begin determining what financial options uh, and financial tools are available and needed in order to make um, this huge climate opportunity a reality um, on the ground on the coast uh, uh, of Oregon. Um, and this really boils down to a lot of different sovereigns and stakeholders working together, tribal nations, working with farmers and foresters and bankers to really think through how to make this meaningful and how to really protect these these critical habitats into the into the future. Um, again, there's a lot of details to figure out here, but that you know nothing should pre preclude the governor and others from um, really take the taking the commission's proposal and starting to to run with it. Uh, next slide. So, in terms of how you can help, um, climate change and its impacts can leave all of us, uh, definitely me included, sometimes feeling a little helpless as to how to act. Um, but I do think when we act collectively, we can achieve a whole lot. Um, and if you've taken anything away from this presentation, I hope that um, it includes the notion that Oregon's coast and its people and its habitats um, have a huge role to play in, in climate solutions. Um, a couple options here, um, and I can post these links when I'm done uh, gabbing at you, I can post these links in the chat, um, contact your, uh, our governor. Um, this coming Monday, uh, it's a long meeting, it's one to five, but they're covering a lot, the Oregon Global Warming Commission is, and um, right around four o'clock hour is when they take public comment. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter here. Uh, again, I'll post these links. And then in terms of partnerships, um, Friends of Haystack Rock and Friends of Cape Falcon, I know you you folks might be connected already with these groups, but I just did wanna um, highlight the Oregon Kelp Alliance. They're doing a lot of really great work around uh, the, the question of kelp and, um, and protecting kelp into the future here in Oregon, um, as well as the Alaka Alliance, um, really cool initiative to, to, 
to consider how um, what options we need and, and what habitats we need and how to pull people together to um, potentially re reintroduce um, otters um, to the Oregon coast, which is very cool. Um, and again, just to stay in touch, um, we'd be happy to um, to hear from you um, directly. Um, and we'd be happy to hear from you right now if there are any um, questions we could answer. Um, thank you for, very much for taking the time tonight. Thank you, Bobby and Jasmine. Um, we do have a couple questions. The first one comes from Elizabeth Collins, and she is wanting to know your thoughts on wave energy and is concerned about the negative impacts on habitat. I can give that one a go, Jasmine. If, um... Yeah, am I on mute? Um, uh, so uh, the question again was, was regarding wave energy. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, Bobby, if you want to go ahead, or, or I can go ahead. So. Um, go ahead, Jasmine. Yeah. Yeah. So um, dampening wave energy. So uh, storms get um, stronger and intensify with climate change. Um, these coastal habitats and, and wetlands can really dampen a lot of that energy as it comes in. So if you can imagine, they act almost as a barrier, um, taking on a lot of that wave energy before it, it, hits, um, it hits land. Uh, so in that, in that way, they're really, really uh, providing that coastal uh, ecosystem service. Um, it also it also helps prevent erosion, right? We have been having a lot of a big problem with um, eroding beaches um, along the coast. So having those ecosystems there uh, really distribute that energy so that um, you know coastal erosion is not as big of a pro problem. And um, even though when storms are intensifying, they can take some of that. Um, they can buffer some of that energy as it's coming in. Um, yeah. And uh, sorry, there was a second part to that question, but I missed it. It, it was um, the negative impacts on the habitat. So that impacts that can have in the habitat um, mm -hmm. with energy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, it, it can, um, as storms intensify, uh, you know, these habitats, uh, these habitats can become eroded over time. And so that is definitely not good because you're losing that whole um, habitat as well. Um, and then Bobby, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, so if I'm, I'm getting the question right, I think it's about wave energy as, as in the, um, the technology. Um, oh. <laughs> I think, I'm not, I'm not sure, I, th I think so, because this has, been, um, this has been an emerging issue on, on Oregon's coast. Um, to be quite frank, I, I have not followed the latest on um, wave energy and, and you know, standing here today, or I'm sitting here, um, Pew does, is not really working in that space. And so we don't really have, um, I don't really have a well thought out um, response, honestly. Um, but, you know, I, I know that, um, I know that the state is really looking into wave energy as like, the Oregon as a hub for, um, research around wave energy, not necessarily implementing it um, here writ large. That's, but that's just me off the cuff. The, the last I had, um, I had really checked in on the, um, the wave ener energy issue. But again, it's not, a, it's not an issue that Pew or you know, our team has a um, particularly take, particular take on. Um, so that's a long winded, um, I'm not so sure <laughs> answer to your question. So apologies. So um, our next question comes from uh, Joe Leibowitz, and his question is, if the natural working lands proposal moves forward, how exactly would it be implemented and matrix tracked so we know goals are being accomplished? Bobby, would you like to take that one? Yeah. Um, boy. It's a really great question. Thank you for the question, Joe. Um, I think it's a little unclear um, at, at this stage. Um, I think uh, it depends. I think it sort of depends on where, if the proposal, like the um, the implementation of the proposal, really rests with with the governor and through executive action, um, 
essentially tasking agencies to um, to really implement a lot of the things. Uh, I do understand that there's there's quite a bit in there that would um, would require legislative action, and so it really depends on where the um, where the issue rests. But um, there's ways, you know. I think I think there's multiple multiple agencies that. Are already in the conversation that will um, play a meaningful role. I know that um, Oregon's um, Department of Land Conservation and Development is is looking closely at this. Um, I think there's ways that that OWEB could play a role, um, but the quantification, um, you know, at this at this stage, um, it's it's so early. Uh, um, you know, all, all of all of what we said about how this this is the blue carbon stuff is really measurable and quantifiable um, is absolutely the case. But I think what hasn't come yet is um, kind of the Oregon D DEQ, the, the Department of Enqui Environmental Quality and other types of um, regulatory agencies around in states around the country. It's so new that the, I think they're um, they're not quite there yet in in incorporating this into their um, into their regulatory math around climate, but I think that that could potentially be a next step as well. Um, also, the Oregon Department of Energy is really looking at this um, in terms of their um, their role in climate action, and um, it looks to be it's a it's a really wonky track, but um, th it's something that they've been working on. Actually, that's this is what we'll hear from uh, the Oregon Department of Energy on Monday um, at the o Oregon Global Warming Commission. We'll hear a little bit more about their their plans, but one of the things that I think is interesting for this this crowd and in this issue area is that they are going to be looking at how co-benefits of different actions to sequester carbon. Um, what are the co-benefits of that? So, and again, that gets back to one of the earlier slides about like, should we protect this area and or conserve this area um, because it reduces greenhouse gases and it also protects salmon or it helps protect us from sea level rise, right? Like. Really trying to factor those in, and so I think it's um, the Oregon Department of Energy could be real, on an, a really interesting track on that front. Um, so I'll and leave it at that. Just yeah, ahead, Jasmine. Probably thoughts on the science front as well. Um, we definitely need more data. So some of these environments, uh, as I mentioned, have been inventoried, uh, but we are missing a whole a whole other environments like seagrass meadows or eelgrass here uh, in the state of Oregon. So those have not been inventoried yet. So in order for implementation to happen, we also need to have those numbers. Um, so yeah, I just uh, want to say that more data, more data is necessary as well. Great. Okay, so our next question comes from um, Nadia Gardner. Um, and she is saying, um, on the North Oregon coast, we have Haystack Rock, a marine garden, and Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. What role might marine protection areas like these play in carbon mitigation? Great, um, I can go ahead and take that. Um, so uh, first it really just goes to the core of definition. Marine protected areas are protecting uh, those areas um, and they're protecting, uh, the, you know, they have catch limits. Um, so in that sense, um, they uh, are basically uh, containing those ecosystem services uh, and they, without, you know, if you're not degrading that ecosystem or developing it, uh, then you're definitely reaping those carbon benefits. Uh, but like I said, a whole host of other ecosystem benefits. So protecting those areas is, is really crucial to prevent degradation or, or development. Um, so in that sense, they can really contribute to, to carbon sequestration because leaving those um, habitats intact, um, you, you know, you really get the whole host and suite of benefits from them. Um, okay, so our next question is from oh, Margaret. Just, oh, sorry. sorry real, real quick, I just wanted, it made me, um, the question from Nadia made me want to also add to Jasmine's piece about um, uh, the Nature Conservancy. Um, TNC, um, we, it's, it's my understanding, TNC in Oregon is, is taking a, a really closer look um, at blue carbon in the marine space as well. And so I think um, just to shout them out is like another a potential um, partner here in the mix to really um, potentially help help us think through how 
what what is the relationship between blue carbon sequestering greenhouse gases and um, and our our infrastructure of marine reserves um, now and into the future. So then our next question comes from Margaret Treadwell. Um, for those working on tidal wetland and Sitka spruce swamp conservation and restoration, how far away are we from the state's recognition of the importance of blue carbon leading to additional funding sources for this work? <laughs> uh, I think I'll, I'll take this one. Um, oh, um, crystal ball. I, you know, I, I think, um, well, I'll talk about this week, you know, it, this week is COP26, which is the council of the parties. This is, as folks may know, is, uh, the global conference where, um, uh, nations, um, come together and, and are, really working towards hopefully some real commitments um, on climate. Um, our governor, uh, uh, Governor Kate Brown is there and there's been a lot of great commitments that have come out even in the last week and the last couple of days um, from the governor. Governor signed on to a couple of things that around ocean acidification, which has been a, um, a key um, issue for the governor and for the state of Oregon and for the whole West Coast. Um, and so I guess, not to not to take your question, Margaret, to like the thirty thousand foot level, but I think I'm broadly optimistic that this is gonna this is gonna start to mean something on the ground for um, new tools, as I think you're kind of pointing to new conservation tools, new funding streams, uh, and that sort of thing. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic that this is this could start rolling in the next couple of years. But again, it it really um, I think it hinges upon these next steps, I think the commission has really done its job to say, to create the platform here um, via the natural and working lands proposal. And now it's kind of up to um, the governor and the legislature and, and others to see, you know, make it, make it meaningful. Great, so then our next question comes from Carla Cole. Is there any work being done at the legislation, legislative level to better protect the few small pockets Sitka spruce wetlands that are left? Um, I, can, I can take that one as well. Um, the, um, I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> I will say, <laughs> to be honest. And, and I, I will say, you know, um, Pew is not really engaged at the legislative level on this on this issue or um, or other issues in in Oregon. So we don't we frankly don't track the legislature um, that much. Um, so I can't really speak to it. Fair enough. Um, so then we have a couple of follow up questions from uh, Joe Leibowitz. How do you think the blue carbon sequestration efforts in Oregon will inform the upcoming efforts to update Oregon's estuary management plans. Well, I think I'm, uh, I'll, I'll take this one too. I, um, I'm really hopeful that it will. Um, I think, um, I feel like I'm, I'm answering everything with like, it depends, um, but <laughs> Um, you know, I think if I think if there is meaningful action from um, and next steps from from the, the governor or say the legislature, um, I think that that changes the conversation on the ground um, in in the places that Joe that the the questioner is talking about um, in the Yaquina Estuary Management Plan, for example. Um, so I think there might be, you know, as I mentioned, this the estuary management plans are basically um, their land use plans. And so if if we as a state are having a new conversation about like, hmm, how do we um, how do we really track and better quantify um, and then better manage uh, these coastal wetlands, these coastal habitats uh, because of carbon, because of co-benefit, all the co-benefits, then I think it does change the conversation about like, um, you know, in, in estuary management plans, like, um, do we do we decide to create new 
new, new uses or new types of management within those estuaries because um, you know we're carving out space or we're we're talking to farmers and saying like you know your land is not it's not um, you can't grow because sea level rise, saltwater intrusion is a real thing. Like what options do you have for your family farm? Um, if you're able to gain, if, if there are funding streams wherein that farmer is able to um, essentially farm carbon, which is a, a emerging conversation, um, you know, then I think that changes the conversation a little bit. And so that's the kind of thing that I, I am hopeful and I think others are hopeful, the conversation that um, I think can and should be happening within the context of, as Joe mentioned, these Oregon estuary management plan updates and in this larger blue carbon conversation, um, policy conversation in Oregon. So, and I think that um, is gonna lead into our next question also by Joe. Um, she says, Bobby mentioned that there is a lot of promise in restoring the tidal forested wetlands. If there is so little left, does that mean creating new tidal forested wetlands, converting existing habitats, or just restoring the little that is left? Um, I'll take this one too. So from, I am, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a specialist in this field, From but from what I can gather, um, the reason that there is one of the, the many reasons that um, to focus on these forested tidal wetlands is their restoration potential. Um, so in other words, I mean, for, for folks who practice it, um, and I don't, but restoration is really hard and it's hard to get right. But um, from everything I've read and, and the conversations we've had um, with with managers and researchers and um, and whatnot is that the, the potential to um, to restore these forested tidal wetlands is is there in a in a more meaningful way than um, than say other habitat types. And then I think our last question comes from Angela Benton. Uh, first, she wants to thank you both. Uh, she really enjoyed your talk. She found it very interesting. Um, her question is, what are the current biggest threats to kelp and eelgrass? How significant is the impact of sea urchins on kelp forests? Yeah, I can go ahead and take that. So um, the biggest impact to kelp and seagrass is really climate change. Um, so with warming waters, I'm sure you've heard um, kelp really suffers because it really needs that surge of cold, uh, nutrient rich waters. So um, of course, climate change really um, increases the temperature of the, of the ocean. And so that is definitely bad for um, kelp and uh, eelgrass. However, there are other more localized, uh, I would say stressors that um, add to the, to, to the decline of kelp or eelgrass. And those are like, pollutants coming in. So eutrophication for, from um, near shore habitats. Um, as well as over harvesting, uh, which could be an issue. Um, as far as urchins, um, I, I might get, I might have Bobby talk a little bit more about uh, the work that's being done um, through the Pew side um, in Oregon uh, to protect kelp. But um, as far as urchins, yes. So um, kelp, you know, you get these kelp beds and um, the decline of, of kelp. So as soon as uh, kelp goes away, because it you know it goes, it has this growth phase, right? So um, if you know the, the budding kelp, I would I guess I would call it as it's growing. If it's not growing fast enough at the rate, like urchins can definitely overtake that. And if it's not coming back, um, urchin populations grow and they can just continuously feed on that kelp. And sometimes they continuously feed even if that kelp. Um, you know, it's very low to the ground. So uh, urchins are a big problem. Um, and as I have heard, and I'm new, I'm kind of new to the West Coast region. So um, they have come, they, they're spreading along the West Coast. So it started really bad in California. And now we're seeing that problem intensify in Oregon and Washington as well. Uh, so those local or stressors are definitely adding to the decline of kelp. Um, yeah, so uh, those are some of the, the biggest issues facing kelp and eelgrass um, right now. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. I, I would add, 
just again, and I posted it in the chat, but not everybody's a participant in the Zoom. So I'll just say um, the Oregon Kelp Alliance has done a lot of, it is emerging and, and doing a lot of great work um, on this front. And they are um, OregonKelp.com. Um, and I would, I would definitely refer um, to them. And I'll post all of the links um, on our Facebook site. So you folks watching, if you wanna go ahead and take a look at that, as soon as we're done here, I'll go ahead and put those in the comment section. Bobby, Jasmine, Kristen, thank you so much. It was a really great presentation. Um, thank you guys all for watching too. You had very thoughtful, good questions. Um, Kristen, is there anything you wanna add on the end? Good, cause you're still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, just thank you so much for joining us. And um, if, well, actually, I do. If you're interested, we have a celebration, a virtual celebration coming up. Um, please check out our Facebook page. And um, other than that, thank you so much for, you know, sticking around for the talk. Thanks, Bobby and Jasmine. Thank you, thank you, thank you Kristen. Everybody. Thanks, Tiffany. Be well.